How can we create a home environment that helps ADHD kids to thrive? That's what we're going to explore in this week's episode of Pookie Ponders. Let's dive straight in. Welcome to another episode of Pookie Ponders. In today's discussion, we're diving into the world of supporting children with ADHD in their home environment. We will explore the fundamental aspects of creating a conducive space, implementing routines and structured schedules, employing effective parenting strategies, regulating emotions, using technology wisely, and the crucial role of family dynamics. It's going to be a wild ride. Strap in, there's a lot. So ADHD, it can be challenging but with the right support and strategies our kids with ADHD can thrive at home. So let's explore some strategies to make home life a little bit more manageable both for you and your child. Okay so thinking first about just the general home environment. So establishing a nurturing organized home environment is going to be essential for living well with kids with ADHD. This space should minimize distractions where we can and support their well-being in various activities including things like studying. So some practical tips for making this work. So one, have designated activity zones. So setting up specific areas for various activities like studying, play, relaxation, having like clearly defined zones or spaces can help your child to understand their purpose and move well between activities. We can create organisation stations, so we can use storage solutions, easy ones like shelves, drawers and bins to keep belongings tidy and easily accessible. Labelling the containers will encourage that organisation. We need to make this as easy as possible because this is something that our ADHD kids will find hard. Next, think about minimal distractions. So having like quiet zones and and like rules about quiet during particularly focused tasks. So for example, like during study time, then we might say that other distractions like TV, video games or other noisy activities are off limits. So those quiet zones or quiet times can really help with that focus where it's needed. Next, having little comfortable retreats. So making sure that there's like seating or little nooks or crannies, little zones um, in different places that's really comfortable and well lit where needed to make spaces that are like really conducive to throwing ourselves into that hyper focus mode and getting on with tasks that we might want to, whether those are kind of work, study related or more related to play and enjoyment. Having the right space space to get in the zone can help with the flow and bring a lot of joy uh, whatever we're working on Um, and then finally visual support can be helpful so employing visual aids like calendars or to-do lists in key areas to help your child to stay organized and aware of what's going on and aware of their responsibilities too So this approach is going to help to create like a versatile and ADHD friendly home environment that's going to support various aspects of your child's life. Let's think next about the importance of my favorite routine and structure. So establishing routines and structured schedules is going to be a bit of a cornerstone of helping children with ADHD to thrive at home. These routines are going to create some predictability that's going to be really comforting for children with ADHD. Boring in a good way. It's going to help them manage their time and tasks more effectively too. So how do we make it work? I hear you cry. Well, funny you should ask. Five ideas for that always. Um, First of all, we can have visual schedules. So having like a visual daily schedule that your child can see and actually follow through can help them to know what to expect throughout the day. We use this all the time in school. So maybe we can think about using it at home as well. Having morning and evening routines, so implementing consistent morning and bedtime routines that includes tasks like getting dressed, brushing teeth, packing school bags. Having those routines really helps everybody to know what's happening next, what happens at this time, what order do we do things in. It makes it much, much more likely that we're not going to forget things. And that feeling of routine creates that feeling of familiarity and safety as well. Next, we can think about time blocking. So teaching our children to allocate specific blocks of time for different tasks or subjects. So for example, we might set aside a block of time for homework. We might set aside a block of time for creative play or gaming. We might set aside a time for outdoor activities. Time blocking can be really effective. 
It's great for adults as well. I'm a big fan of time blocking. I'm working, then I'm working and I'm indistractable. It's family time. I'm all about the family right now. I'm not feeling guilty in family time for not working. I'm not feeling guilty when I'm working about family time because I've blocked that time with purpose and that works really well. But yeah, it can work well for our kids as well. Block the time, then they know if I've done my work here and I focus hard here, I've got this time for gaming and I'm going to really enjoy it. Okay, the other thing you can do kind of building on that is weekly planning. So at the start of each week, actually sitting down with your child if you can and planning out the week ahead. This is going to include that time blocking. So you might put in some study sessions, you might put in those extracurricular sessions, might put in some family time, some gaming time, plan it out ahead where we can gives us all things to look forward to and helps us to make sure that nothing gets missed. Um, And then the other thing here when we're thinking about that like routine and structure is that we will need, unfortunately for people like me, a little bit of flexibility. So we're going to need to review and adjust. So regularly have a look at your routines and schedules with your child and make little adjustments as necessary just to make sure that they're actually manageable and they're effective and they're working for the whole family. Okay, so you've nailed routines and structures. Now we're going to think about effective parenting strategies in a nutshell for parenting children with ADHD. So a few things here, just like guidelines really I suppose positive reinforcement is is the most powerful strategy here so it's really crucial I believe to avoid excessive punishment and negative input children with ADHD there's really harrowing research on how much more negative intervention they get compared to their peers it's it's many 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 times more so they hear so 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 many negative things about where they shouldn't be what they shouldn't be doing what they've got wrong and it can really begin to impact very negatively on on their self-esteem. So we want instead to focus in on the positives and on their strengths and use techniques that are going to like praise them, reward them and clearly communicate what is going well with them as well. So in terms of these like general um, strategies, so so praise and encouragement is, is the number one one we're going to think about. So just acknowledging and praising your child's efforts, not always the outcomes, it's the process, their efforts, their trying. Remember with your kids with ADHD, no, it's possible no task ever gets finished. That's okay. We want to praise the behaviors that we want to encourage. So this is about trying hard, about giving things a go, about being bold and brave, about trying new things, whatever it might be for your child right now. Praise that behavior rather than the outcomes. When we are too focused on praising outcomes, we can get to a point where we're never praising our ADHD child because sometimes there just isn't an outcome. They don't quite get there when they've done great things. So let's find the good and tell them them in our spontaneous, sincere, specific way, what was good about what they have done. This is going to like really begin to boost their self-esteem and motivation over time and helps them to see themselves through a slightly different lens as well. When we start changing the story, we're telling positive stories about what they've done right and what they've done well. Then they do start to see themselves a little bit differently when them when they're always hearing about you haven't finished this, you haven't done that, you got that wrong, you had the wrong thing, which is the narrative ADHD kids unfortunately do tend to hear in their lives. You could think about a reward system. Some people like like this. So a reward system where your child is going to earn points or tokens or stars for completing tasks or for their positive behaviors. Some people love this. Some children are really motivated by it. Some people hate it. Have a think about what might or might not work in your family and whether those rewards are a good thing, whether you might want to exchange them for some kind of like prize or treat that your child is working towards. In our house, that tends to be like a graphic novel or a bubble tea or something, but it just depends in your house. Think about what you think is going to work here. Next thing in terms of just general effective parenting strategies, clear communication. This is something I harp on a lot about like across all manner of my work. We need to be able to hear and understand each other and we need to know that the message we think we've conveyed is the one that has been heard. So maintaining really open and clear communication between adults and children and between everyone in the household really. So having expectations that are really clear. Our child knows what to expect of us. We know what we can expect of them. The rules make sense and everybody understands what the consequences are of their potential actions and that this is just straightforward and understandable. So really concise, 
really clear communication, making sure, checking in that what we think we've conveyed is what's actually been heard, is where we're going to stop ourselves going too wrong. What we don't want is to be kind of communicating at cross purposes in either direction. So just keep it open, keep it honest and keep checking in. If you are going to need consequences for behavior, and sometimes this is, you know, something that may feel necessary, just make sure that they are appropriate to the behavior and that those consequences are like related in context. So for example, if a child's left a toy out repeatedly and it's something you've been asking them to do differently, then you might take that toy away just for a short time. Finally, the final idea here is one that you may or may not like the idea of, and I guess that's true of of every idea, but the idea of family meetings. So some families that I have supported have talked about how beneficial they found family meetings. Now, you might not make these like a formal thing, like it would feel a bit like you're at work. Okay, guys, on the agenda today, family meeting, who's chairing? It doesn't have to be like that, but bringing the family together, even in an informal way, just to discuss feelings, concerns, ideas, and do a bit of problem solving together. So bringing the family together like this and making sure that everybody's voice is actually heard, that we're able to tackle problems early and head on and we're able to explore together different ways of doing things if things need to change, checking on routines and schedules and that kind of things as well. It just creates a sense of like belonging, like everybody belongs in the family, everyone's involved in the family, everyone is heard in terms of their opinions and their values and we're all kind of part of that decision making problem solving process. It can work but yeah just think about how to make it work well in your family. So there's a few ideas there for effective parenting strategies. So now let's go on to the big old topic of how do we help our ADHD kids to manage their emotions. So children with ADHD are often going to really struggle with emotional regulation. So teaching them strategies and creating a supportive environment to help them to manage those emotions and frustration is going to be absolutely crucial for their well-being and enabling them to thrive at home. So a few things that you can do here. So teaching your children breathing strategies. So teaching them like deep breathing techniques in particular where we're going to have a long out breath can really help them to calm down when they're feeling overwhelmed or frustrated. So my favorites here would include the feather on the hand where we imagine we've got a feather on the hand and we're going to breathe out long and slow to keep that feather floating for as long as possible. Or five seven breathing where we breathe in for the count of five and out for the count of seven. Or we can do something as simple as blowing bubbles. Blowing bubbles is awesome for so many reasons but it really also encourages that deep out breath and if you haven't got any bubbles use some imaginary ones that will have the same impact um next strategy here around emotional regulation positive self-talk so sadly because adhd kids often get so much negative input all the time we often find that their internal narrative becomes quite negative and can be quite geared towards failure and hopelessness and just really picking themselves apart. And what we want to try and do is switch that, reverse that to try and help them to see their strengths, help them to play to those strengths and begin to see the positives in day to day life. So we're trying to switch that story up a little bit. So we can help by first noticing this negative self-talk and encouraging our child to talk to us a little bit about what is it that they're hearing in their head and then working with them to reframe that. What's a different way of looking at that? What would a friend say? What would I say? Trying to replace that negative voice with a more positive one so that rather than your child dragging themselves down and creating those feelings of sadness and anger and frustration that can feel so difficult, instead trying to bring a bit more of a balanced voice into their head. Next idea is emotion cards. So you can create like emotion or emoji type cards um, or indeed you can buy them as well. I'm a big fan of chatties as I've mentioned about 8 million times on the podcast. That's chatties. C-H-A-T-E-E-Z developed by a social worker who was using emojis to work with children and young people in her care. I adore them. I have big sets and little sets that you can carry around on a key ring and when my children were still attending school they carried them everywhere with them because when they could not speak to say how they felt or they couldn't find the right word they could show an emoji and that worked really effectively i'm in no way (laughs) like it makes it sound like and this podcast is sponsored by chatties it's not i just 
blimmin' well love them. They are awesome. But you can also make your own. So creating like emotion cards, essentially using emojis can be super powerful with kids. Um, or you could use animals or colors, whatever cards, which are going to represent different emotions. And then your child can just point to the card or show the card that represents how they're feeling right now. A thing we can think about using is timeouts. So timeouts can be really effective. When a child is beginning to feel overwhelmed, they're getting to the point where they're not managing anymore, actually just offering for them to go to a comfortable space, to a little nook, a little space, to somewhere that feels safe so that they can begin to calm down and start to regulate. They may be able to do that on their own. They might need to be able to do that with your support. What we should not do in these moments when tempers are rising, when we're beginning to feel very anxious or very angry or very frustrated, is just try to persevere. You are on to a losing wicket when you do this. When a child begins to be overwhelmed in any way, when anyone begins to feel overwhelmed in any way, their brain is essentially going to go offline. Their thinking, speaking, problem solving brain will be gone. And that very primitive brain comes in. That's all about kind of survival and fight and flight. And it can get kind of messy. This is when we're going to end up in like meltdown or shutdown um, and just trying to like trying to continue with things, trying to have a conversation, trying to problem solve at this time is likely to push the kid over the edge. And this is when we see those eruptions or when they come completely back in on themselves. Whereas if instead we can catch that this is happening, that tempers are rising or our child is moving towards shutdown and we allow them to regulate and give them that space, then once things are calm, we can revisit, we can start to introduce those demands again a little bit and be thinking, okay, let's have a look at how we can problem solve this situation together or simply move on and come back to it later. So timeouts, really, really effective tool here. Don't be afraid to use them as much as is needed. And then finally, we can use things like emotion journaling. So helping your child to keep an emotion journal where they can record their feelings and what triggered them and what happened next and what helped and what didn't. Just getting really curious about how they're feeling day to day. So we can begin to name that. We can begin to explore that and get really curious about it. It can be really interesting for you and for your child, it can really improve that emotional literacy and can help us to work out how to plan better for the future. Now, be creative as you like in emotion journaling. It doesn't have to be like pen and paper, though it can be, but this might be something that is done through art or done through like vlogging or you might do an audio recording or do it as a um, stop motion animation with Lego, whatever. It's whatever works for your child. And remember, you've probably got a very creative little person there. So think with them about what might work here. But finding these ways to really explore and get curious about our feelings, our emotions can be a really great thing to do. The more we understand them, the more that we're able to cope with them, to manage them, to work with them day to day. Okay, so that's emotional regulation. Now we're just going to dip really briefly into how we can use technology to uh, support children with ADHD because lots of them will really find, like many of their peers, ADHD or not, that like technology can really hook them in. So if we can use it to our advantage, that's going to work really, really well in our household. So um, we can use it to support like learning and organization for our children with ADHD. So for example, educational apps. Educational apps can be really zero they can speak to the sensory seeking needs of some of our ADHD kids and can make learning actually really quite good fun. So for example, in my house right now, we're all into the Duolingo. So my girls are both learning languages, but there are other things you can do too. I think they like the maths as well on Duolingo. So Duolingo is a really like responsive app that keeps you learning really fast, gives you loads of feedback. It makes noise. It makes you talk as well as listen, as well as read. It's really fun and it's very like gamified and my kids just love it and it comes in tiny little bursts so you can do just like three minutes a day to keep your streak going and it's always encouraging you to do a bit more it's a really fab app that my kids have loved but there are loads of other educational apps out there that you can use to help with this kind of thing so with younger kids in particular there are great things like timetable apps and we've always really enjoyed typing apps get your kids doing typing um, again for our neurodivergent kids often typing is is more possible for them than writing and you may or may not get permission for them to do this at school but in life being able to touch type honestly best most useful skill I have use it 
every single day. So I am dyslexic as well as autistic and just being able to type everything. These days, there are such amazing tools to help. So Grammarly helps me loads and loads and loads every day to not completely not make sense. When I write, and I do write by hand because I love the feeling of it and it's quite a sensory thing for me, writing with a fountain pen on nice paper. But I'll be honest, my writing looks really beautiful when I want it to, but often I've just written complete I just, there's no good word for it. I, I can't understand it back. If I don't turn my handwritten notes quickly into something on the computer, they're making no sense to anyone. So, you know, you yeah, think about your use of your educational apps and the tech to support uh, that learning uh, and, and making it fun as well, which is often a good way to get more learning happening. Then we can use things like digital calendars, time management tools, organizational apps. So teaching our kids to use digital calendars um, to uh, kind of know what's coming up, to set reminders, maybe think about when we're going to do our homework, when we're going to be going and uh, doing our other kind of time blocks for fun stuff, for gaming, for family activities and so on. Um, And then using like time management tools as well to help to like allocate and use time more effectively. Like role model here, show your child how you do this and um, and then think with them about what apps might work for them. Many kids love this stuff and they will actually really enjoy that process of thinking about what they're going to do when and their routines uh, and, and that kind of thing. So, so play to that and, and have a look together at some apps that might really help here. Um, and then um, you can also use these uh, like organizational type apps as well to just help kids like stay on top of their responsibilities as well. So be driven a little bit by them and a little bit by you. But yeah, have a look, have a play, have a think about what, what apps are out there that, that might help with some of the issues that you're tackling day to day here. Um, And finally, then in terms of tech, the other thing you might think about doing is working with your child to think about whether there should be any time limits or controls on the apps that they're using or on their devices more generally. So what we often find is that um, when we speak to children, they are spending much more time on their devices and in their apps than they actually really want to, that they would actually like to engage with other things as well. But they're so addictive. I mean, the greatest mind in the world right now are paid huge amounts of money in Silicon Valley to keep us hooked in on our devices and so we all find it hard particularly hard if you are ADHD and those dopamine hits really really do it for you and you're sensory seeking and you're really craving this stuff so we can think with our children at a time of calm about what kind of limits might actually be reasonable here think too with them about what other things they want to be doing outside of having their head in a screen Um, and then with their agreement and working together we can set up some like time limits and parental controls just to make sure that our child like isn't distracted when they should be doing other things, whether that is study or whether that is play outside of their devices. So, but but do it with them. These are conversations we can have with our children. When you do it to them, then often it's received quite badly. And let's be honest, they're good at this stuff. They're going to hack their way around it and they're just going to find a way to access what they want to without you knowing. So much better that we work together if we can with our children on creating rules, guidelines, parameters, boundaries, however you want to look at it, that work for everyone. Okay, and then the final like area I want to think about today in terms of how we can enable our ADHD kids to thrive at home is the role of family dynamics more generally. So sort of having a supportive family around you is going to play a pivotal role in, in helping uh, children with ADHD to thrive at home. But it's also going to be really important for enabling every single other member of the family to thrive as well, because we're all living together. We have to make this work for everyone. So thinking about this, um, there are a few things that we might do. So first of all, revisiting that idea of family meetings. You may or may not like it, but have a think about it. It can work well. Um, And the key thing here is making sure that every voice is heard. What can sometimes happen is if we've got a child with special or additional needs that we think really carefully about meeting their needs, and sometimes their siblings get a little bit lost or forgotten in this. So if we're going to have any kind of family meetings like this, we want to make sure that every voice is heard here and that everyone feels that their value their opinions, their ideas, their concerns are valid and valued. 
So that like then leads me on to like sibling involvement. So we want to involve siblings. We want to make sure that they get their time um, as well as the ADHD child. Um, but we also need to make sure that they understand each other. So if we have a neurotypical and a neurodivergent child, it's really helpful if we can educate them about each other and help them to understand what each other's world feels like, because otherwise they can end up with like some animosity or challenge between our children because they only know their own world to them it's going to be obvious that everybody experiences the world like me when of course we know that's not the case but when you're little your worldview is the only worldview so we need to educate our kids about how things feel for each other why their sibling might find certain things hard and why certain things might frustrate or irritate them the more we can talk about this in an open non-judgmental way and get really curious about it the better our kids will understand each other and the more they'll be able to actually support each other and create that like really positive family dynamic other things that have worked well in some families and may or may not work well in yours, she says, like, slightly unsure whether to introduce this idea, but like cooperative family chores. So household chores that actually promote cooperation between family members with age appropriate tasks can work really well. They can, in my opinion, like in my experience, work really well or it can go horribly wrong but where we're able to it doesn't have to be a chore but where we're able to work towards the more in psychology subordinate goals so working together with a common goal in mind can be really bonding and good for like team spirit and connection uh, and that sort of thing so thinking about whether there are ways in which we can like work together and, and just chores and things that need doing at home is an obvious one like cooking together can be really fun for example but it's about putting the right support and scaffolding in place so that this can happen successfully because it can go really wrong if we don't put that support in place and then that's not so great for the family dynamics um other things where we can think about working together as a team because teamwork is really great as a family and really helps with that dynamic um so we might think about like those daily routines that we talked about earlier so what the morning looks like and what the evening looks like rather than just thinking what does the adhd child need thinking about what every member of the family needs and how together we can create routines and schedules that work for the whole family. So what does that morning need to look like in order to meet the needs of every member of the family? Let's problem solve this together and act as a bit of a team. Within your family, there are going to be people who are good at some things and struggle with others and vice versa. So the thing is like doing a little bit of a family audit and understanding where those strengths and challenges lie and actually looking to some members of the family to really step up to where their strengths are and then perhaps giving them a little bit of respite from the things that they might find a bit more challenging because between us we potentially going to get it all covered. Um, and then finally, actually setting aside time for family fun, blocking out some quality family time uh, where we can so that we can just do some stuff that makes our hearts sing, that makes us laugh, that brings us joy um, so that we can really begin to like strengthen and dive into those family bonds and having time which is just for family, just for fun, when we're just laughing and enjoying ourselves can be such a valuable thing to do. You don't have to have loads of time for this. So if you're really struggling time wise, that's that's OK. But even just small amounts of times when we're fully throwing ourselves into that family time can really make a difference to the family dynamic here. So hopefully all these many practical ideas will be a bit of a springboard to help you to create a bit of a more positive and supportive home environment for your ADHD child so that they can thrive and also begin to develop some of the essential skills that they are going to need both within and beyond your home. There you have it. Another insightful, I hope, journey through supporting our children today with ADHD at home. So with the right environment, routines and some effective parenting, then our children with ADHD can thrive. They can manage their emotions. They can use technology wisely and benefit from the support of the whole family. I hope that some of these ideas are going to bring a little bit of joy, maybe some effectiveness to your home life.
I hope there were some helpful ideas in here for you. If you did like what you heard today, then please like, subscribe and share my work. You can support my work further by joining me over on Patreon, where you get early access to all of my resources and the chance to influence what I work on next. Or you can invite me to speak at your next event or in your setting, either virtually or face to face. Thank you so much for listening and for everything that you are doing for the children and young people in your care. This has been Pookie Ponders with me, Pookie Knightsmith. Until next time, stay curious, stay compassionate and keep pondering. Over. <laughs>